Boy, do I have a special treat for you today. I'm interviewing one of my friends, CSA farmer Tessa DeMaster from Willow Haven Farm. She's going to be sharing her sales funnel for her CSA product today, but she's also going to be talking about how she's changed things up over the last few years, simplified and distilled her product line down to one thing. We're going to talk all about how she did it in today's episode. Let's get started. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 152 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench, one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farms CSA out in Elmore, Ohio. And I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help farmers get more confident in marketing and messaging so you can grow your business online. So many farmers have never been trained in marketing and you feel incredibly unsure of what you're doing. And that is where I come in. I love teaching this stuff and I'm trying to help you learn this important skill set so you can make your business stronger. I'm so glad you're here today. If you're new to the show, please subscribe and check out some of my early podcast episodes, especially numbers one through 10. They're designed to be an onboarding ramp into the marketing lingo. It's a great place to start. For all my regular listeners, I want to encourage you to leave me a rating or a review if you haven't done that yet. I'm doing a special challenge, trying to get more people to review my podcast And I'm going to be picking somebody next month to give a prize to, and I'll read their review on the podcast. So thanks for doing that. Hey, today's podcast is sponsored by my friends at Local Line, which is actually our e-commerce platform of choice. Local Line is the leading e-commerce platform for the local food system. Bring your farm online by using Local Line for e-commerce, inventory management, deliveries, and online payments. Made for farmers, CSAs, food hubs, farmers markets, and more. Local Line's comprehensive list of features will help you increase sales, streamline your processes, and save you time. Some of the features they have include branded online stores for retail and wholesale customers, flexible payment options, product packages and workflows for items sold by weight, and robust sales reports and analytics to keep you growing. Trusted by over 9,600 farmers and food producers, Local Line offers farmers the ability to own their own sales channels and reach their customers in a whole new way. Try Local Line today for free and get a premium feature using my coupon code DigitalFarmer2022. Terms and conditions apply. For more information, check out the link in the show notes or Go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash local line. And don't forget to use my code digitalfarmer2022 to get that free premium feature. Let's get started with today's episode. So my guest for today is my good friend Tessa DeMaster from Willow Haven Farm in Pennsylvania. And I've been really excited about bringing her on the show. I've known her for several years. In fact, we hung out for like half the day at the PASA conference a couple of years ago. And she was so helpful in connecting me and networking me with the certain farmers there when I didn't know anyone. And she's so approachable. She's really good at marketing. And I love just talking to her and bouncing ideas off of her. And I just find that she and I learn from each other. So I've wanted her on the show for a long time because I think she runs a really great marketing gig with her CSA. And in this episode, we're going to talk about several things, but what you're going to hear is how she has over time really distilled her product mix down to one thing. She's really simplified the marketing and the the entire sales funnel. And I think that's made her business even stronger. She has a lot of clarity about what it is that they do and what they're going to do well. And 
I just can't wait to see what her CSA is going to become. So Tessa is the co-owner of Willow Haven Farm along with her husband, Ruben, and they currently run a 500 plus member CSA year round. Growing up on her family farm in Pennsylvania, uh, Tessa spent her summers in the large family garden that they called the truck patch. And she would help her mother every summer picking beans, weeding, cutting fruit and vegetables for the hundreds of jars of canned and frozen produce that they would put up. Now she spends less time out in the field in their business and more time in the kitchen doing the same preserving for her own farm family. She has nine children, you guys. Farmer Ruben values her many hours doing much of the behind the scenes marketing, writing emails to cultivate customers and capturing the farm story every week. She's always learning along the way in her quest to improve the farm experience for each of her current and future farm members. Over the years, she and Ruben have grown their 230 member CSA to a 500 plus member year round customized farm box delivery program which we're gonna talk about at length in this episode. Without further ado, please welcome Tessa DeMaster to the show. Well, Tessa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Corinna. It's really exciting to be on. Well, I would love it if you would start out this interview just laying out some context for us. Tell us a little bit about your farm, the, the size, the number of acres, how many customers, what it is that you sell, just wherever you wanna start. Sure, yeah. Well, we um, can still consider ourselves a CSA farm, but we have branched out in a lot of different ways. Um, I, last year, we had um, 530 members, and we are primarily growing organic vegetables, but we have also branched out. My daughter is growing cut flowers for us um, for her, and for her own CSA. And um, we've started a cheese business with a partner on the farm. So that's kind of a sister business, but we're, um, we have 70, 80, 70 acres in production, but a lot of that is pasture for the cows um, and for other animals. Um, but I think we're doing about 10 acres of vegetables. So um, it's a pretty good, big production. Our, um, we're pretty much subscription only at this point. We've dropped out of all um, time wasting farmers markets. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> when did that happen? Um, we dropped out of farmers markets a few years ago okay. and because um, uh, they just we weren't in the good ones and we didn't want to spend the time to and they weren't times that we wanted to be there and we didn't want to waste our time on the little ones because that was just too much. <laughs> Yeah, and um, in 2020 and 2021, we did a lot of online sales, um, kind of online farm stand is what we called it. But um, but with a subscription model, I can move, I'm pretty confident that I've convinced all of our regular, um, just online a la carte buyers into, into a subscription. So I'm pretty confident that we can do it that way. How many employees do you have on the farm? In the summer, it goes up to like 15 right now. Um, I have my own assistant um, who works about 10 to 15 hours um, off the farm. And we've got a couple ladies who come in and help pack boxes because we're doing um, winter, spring, every other week deliveries. Um, so, so I'd say about three part-time people in the winter and 15 bodies in the fields and room and stuff during the summer. So clarify to me what your season looks like. It sounds like you have a, a almost a year long CSA. Yeah, so this is our first year, pretty much year round. So our summer um, is 20 weeks, June 1st to mid-October. Then we have, a, this is the second year we've done a winter share that went every other week, no, uh, end of October to um, February. And now with the market box subscription, we are we have a spring season that takes us all the way through. So now we've got every other week deliveries from March till May, and then they can just seamlessly go into summer. Now, do you find that your customers uh, do you go through the whole track, or do you have a certain percentage that splits out? <clears throat> um, so 
in the last two years, we pretty we limited our winter CSA to about a hundred okay. people. So we were that's about a quarter. Um, recognizing the fact that people aren't going to be in love with the same vegetables over and over again um, that comes in a winter CSA and that um, quantities just don't stay the same um, for the winter. But now with, a, with, with being able to add all the other products that we, um, we offer into the same subscription, I'm confident that we can handle a lot more than 100 people in the winter because they'll be able to get their regular staples, bread, eggs, cheese, milk, um, as well as the vegetables that we can come by. Yeah, I'm curious why you decided to become a year long operation. Was that because you wanted to just increase your revenue or was there, you were trying to keep keep your customers in a routine or what yeah, was the Yeah, keep our customers in a routine is something that when I heard that on either your podcast or maybe a graze cart podcast, podcast mm -hmm. um what you know about changing customers habits how they drop off of you and they create a new habit for the winter and then you have to get them back in the habit I realized yeah if we can keep them in the habit of buying from us that will help with retention so mm -hmm. that's kind of why I started moving in that direction Okay, there's so many places I want to go here. Now. Yeah, I had a whole bunch of questions ready to go. And now I'm like, what? Um, I didn't realize that you were like, all market box now. Tell me a little bit, like explain yeah. to our audience, what is the market box subscription? Is it a CSA? Do you call it a CSA? Or how is it? And how has it morphed over time? Like, just give us that whole history. Yeah, so I can give you that history, which has to do with carving out our niche as a farm. So when we started in 2009, Ruben started with home delivery because he was like, we have to, we have to make it easy for people to get from us. And so, um, so we had home delivery and we had people that would come to the farm. Um, and then the next niche was, um, well, we also started growing organically. We weren't certified organic, but going to, you know, one of the first, uh, to the Acres Conference, the organic um, food conference really changed our food journey personally. And all of a sudden I was on board with organics and understood it in a way that had to do with health and nutrition. And um, I was fully committed to the, that model of farming because of you know, how I wanted to raise my family and how I wanted us to eat. And so that, that message um, comes through in my, in my marketing and my education for farm members. We, we live in a huge metro area because we're in the, we're two hours from New York City and an hour and 15 minutes from Philadelphia. And so there's millions and millions of people here. There's a huge transition of people in and out of the area. And there's also a lot of farms. Um, uh, and there was like 20 CSA farms at one point. And so we really felt like we had to carve out our niche and we couldn't compete on the same level as some of the farmers that were bigger than us and better than us. We had to do something that made people wanna buy from us. And I thought that being one of the first customized CSAs was gonna help with that. And so when um, Harvey and Simon Huntley offered the, um, to start building that, we were one of the first 10 farms that te beta tested that with him. And, um, and then following his research and his journey has um, helped us get to the point where we are now. So continuing to customize, continuing to add products that aren't vegetables, and then now creating a subscription box that, um, that has the ability to have meat, eggs, dairy, bread, <laughs> vegetables, and uh, and anything else that we can that that we can get and what we're saying is that um, we want to be regional we want to be local and we want to be vetting the really good food from the really good producers in our area so that other people don't have to do that research and figure it out for themselves yeah. they can get it from us because um, that's a huge time hassle it's to yeah. to to figure out where to get everything from so we want to help be the vehicle that makes it easier for people to get really good food from farms. 
So now your, your market box is really your flagship. It yeah. sounds like, like yeah. that's where everything yeah. streams. Yeah. I, what we, so this has been an evolution of thinking and Ruben was really thinking, my husband's name is Ruben and he was really thinking through the story brand marketing framework this winter. And um, we allowed all of our summer vegetable CSA members to just renew into um, the vegetables share for next year. Uh, Cause that's not a problem. All the organization of all that on the back end with Harvey, it's seamless. It doesn't matter what kind of share people are getting or how many add-on shares or how many other products are getting. The packing line is the same and they can handle it, you know? Um, and so all of those CSA members still are having the product that they had that we promised them and they're getting it again next year. But um, all the new people that are coming to us and saying, yeah, I want to, I want to buy from you. We're saying, are your share is a market box and you can put anything in it. And we did that because we didn't want the sign up process to be confusing for people. We didn't want to have them to have to choose between a market box subscription where they could get everything or a veggie only share. Hmm. Cause there wasn't a lot of difference. It was just a little bit, it's just a little bit of structure. Yeah. Well, and when you go to your website, which is gorgeous, by the way, we're going to talk you. about that at length in just a minute. <laughs> Um, you have a whole kind of block where you talk about here's all the different things you could even put into your box. Yeah. And there are like 20, 25 things yeah, listed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it really looks abundant, right? There's the, it's, it yeah. says mushrooms. Um, I think it says jams and jellies. I, I'm not yeah. sure if it says that, but like there's yeah, different, it does. <laughs> different cheeses and meats. And so, yeah, I mean, someone could read that and go, oh, I, it's like a one-stop shop. I can yeah. get all of these things. And my farmer has vetted this for me and makes yeah. sure that I get it all at once. Yeah. So I love this concept because you're, what you're talking about, this confusion problem is very real. When we have too many products in the CSA product suite, that is one of the risks, right? When you've got right. seven add-on shares. <laughs> yeah, um, and that's what we had. And I find, you know, I finally realized um, people would actually get more choice if we just let everything go into the same box. Because one of the problem with add-on shares is um, they've committed to a bread share all season long. And then they get whatever bread we make that week. And we have different varieties of bread, but eventually people say, I really love olive bread. I wish I could get that most of the time. And I'm not particularly fond of, you know, roasted garlic <laughs> or something. Um, so having it in the market box subscription, they can rate bread as a high preference. So bread will get put in their box every time. Um, and then they can fine tune it. They can see, oh, the bread that's in my box is um, a variety that I don't like as much, but these other four varieties are still available. I can put in one that I like better. So mm -hmm. there's really, there's with preferences um, with Harvey, there's kind of macro customization that you do like for the whole season. And then there's micro customization that you do for your box each week. Week to week, yeah. Yeah. Do you find that most of your clients do use the customization feature? Are they going in and adjusting or? Yeah, 50 to 80% are, are customizing their boxes. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is a certain kind of customer that mm -hmm. you yeah. definitely attract. Would you agree? I mean, there's. Um... They have to be willing to use technology. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. they have to be willing to get an email and do some, you know, they don't have to, but they're going to get a better experience if they get their email, they look at what's going to be in their box and they do some fine tuning. They, they just, you know, they can push a couple things and, and change what's in their box. And it's pretty simple, but you, you have to be committed to getting that email and opening it. What else do you see as a common denominator among your, this type of a CSA model customer? Um, well, I think we're a lot, the, the same as a lot of CSAs still in that um, women is, you know, uh, more than men because they're doing the food buying. Um, um, you know, more, it's not low income usually. Um, 
well, we have different ways of reaching low income people, but it's not the main, the main target audience that's coming to us. Um, <clears throat> Would you say that they are do it from like cook from scratch type of people that enjoy being in the kitchen? Or do you think the customization piece makes them perhaps you, you can attract some picky eaters that way? So yeah, I think we are able to attract more picky eaters. I do, I do really still emphasize an element of you really have to enjoy making meals at home because you're, you know, because you're getting this amazing food, yeah. um, and you're gonna want to use it. But I think um, not being as heavily veggie dependent will make it a little bit more available to people who aren't committed to eating a box of vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. That, that's another reason to go this way is to try to reach a, a wider audience rather than just talking to people who wanna eat more vegetables. We can talk to people that wanna eat more food directly from farmers. Okay, so let's walk me through your, your sales funnel as I call okay. it. Yep. Um, Cause I think this would be really instructional for people who are listening and if you're, if you are listening and you're like, what is a sales funnel? Like this is the pathway that people follow as they first get introduced to a brand and they get pulled in and then eventually might uh, purchase something. And then how do they stay in the brand? So can you just help me help all of us see where does it start? How do people find out about your farm? What are they usually starting with first? And then what's your goal ultimately uh, how to cultivate this customer? What are you trying to get them to do? Yeah, so I think a lot of people do find us by doing a simple Google search. So um, we spent a little bit of time dabbling in SEO, um, and I think that's paid off. And um, so people are looking for a farm near me or vegetables near me or organic vegetables or organic meat or something like that. And those keywords are all pointing towards us. Um, there's other farms too, but once they see us and they see the, that they're interested, I think. Um, we're also on Buy Fresh, Buy Local. We're all um, in their CSA catalog. We're also on Local har Harvest and people find us that way. And of course there's word of mouth, friend referrals and, and things like that. Um, so hopefully they're going to our website and our um and they're looking at the messaging there. And hopefully they're downloading one of the two um, PDF downloads that I have that help show off what is available and help them make decisions on what to get. Yeah, so talk about what those are. That's your lead magnet, right? You're trying to get yep. them on your email list? Yes, So exactly. smart. What are, yep. the, what are the two that you have? What's the titles? So the big one is what's in the box. Um, because we offer so much, people wanna see what they are. Um, and so, the what's in the box download guide um, ha is 11 pages of meeting us, um, has a whole page of like what the different types of um, products they can get, which is the same as what's on the website now with all, all the list, but there's some pictures that go with that mm -hmm. um, in the PDF. And, um, and there's also two harvest cal calendars in there. So vegetable harvest calendar and a fruit harvest calendar. Um, we're not growing and harvesting fruit, but we're dependent on the harvest because we're getting them from other local farms in our area. So um, people like to know what's coming next. Now you had that that designed by um, a graphic designer. I think you told me yes. at the beginning of yes. the interview. Yeah, yeah. I got some help with that because I knew it would take me months to do it if I did it on my own. Mm -hmm. So smart. <laughs> and is that doing pretty well for you? Do you find that's getting clicked it's on? Um, it is, um, I've just, this is so new, Corinna. It's just, okay. um, ah. <laughs> I love that. And I love that you're including pictures. It's almost like you're giving them a directory of your products. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they can yeah. imagine, oh, when it says that I can get some fresh mustard or whatever, like they can, it's probably not even in your <laughs> yeah. store. I'm sorry, but like, they <laughs> no, can see okay. what, what does that look like? Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they're down. What's the other guide? You said there was another the other one? guide is, um, what size box should I choose? You know, so there's three different subscription levels and there's, um, so I have a section on the, what would a veggie heavy box look like 
um, at the three different subscription levels and what else could you put in if it was mostly veggies and then I have three more pictures of the three different sizes of well what would it look like if I wanted other stuff than just a few veggies so mm. um that's such a good point. I hadn't thought of that. So if you open up the doors to just fill your box with whatever you want, you have to kind of help them see. Yeah. What, what does the that volume on... look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'd love to get better pictures, you know, cause we haven't done the market box through the summer, yeah. but I used the best things that I had. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just, you build it little by yeah. little, right? So you'll, exactly. I'm sure you'll take pictures of that this, this summer and yep, definitely. You know, so Okay, so so you have these two great lead magnets, hopefully, yep. and those are great because they're actually designed to attract the person that would eventually buy your end product, right? Yeah. I mean, you're, yep. you're kind of yep. weeding people out. Okay, then what happens? Well, just before this podcast, I connected those lead magnets in ConvertKit to my market box sales sequence. So. Hey! <laughs> Woohoo! Um, so there's now an automation that does that. Um, and, you know, I switched to ConvertKit after you talking about it for um, for a couple of seasons because I just couldn't, the ideas that I got from you, I couldn't make happen in MailChimp or other ways. It was too complicated. And um, I was like, I have, I have to do it this way because this way makes sense. Um, so I've been very happy with um, all the creativity and all that can happen in ConvertKit yeah. um, with all the tagging. And it's really fun to see um you know to tag people and see where people are at in their journey that way yeah you can even tag based on what they buy too like so you can see yeah. these are the people that always get this product or yeah yeah i love that well harvey's not connected to convert kit oh, yet so, okay well but yeah. you could always download a report i suppose and like as a csv file and like you know do that's a great like idea yeah. <laughs> you're like when do i, I have might have that? To, i might have to hire someone to do that <laughs> for the stuff that matters that might be worth it for some yeah. of your you know bigger ticket type things yeah but. definitely okay so to so you have an actual email sales sequence that you have yes. pre-written just want to yep. make sure my audience understands this yep. in your email service provider yep. and that is that triggers automatically when a person downloads one of these or subscribes to one of these guides yep. and they get introduced to the the concept of the market box yep they okay. get introduced they get um they get connected um to our different um ways of communicating with them in the second email and then they start getting some of the um the introduction to the product then they get the nitty-gritty details to the product and then after after that, they get another nudge and say, um, hey, if you still haven't bought yet, here's your here's your deadline for when the season starts. And here's this gorgeous CSA trips and tips and tricks PDF mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. can <laughs> that will help you figure out nice. what to do with everything. Nice. So yeah. Do you have like a special offer that you try to give them in that email to chip them over the line? Or I don't, but I'm just curious if you do. It's like just the PDF. Okay. You know, yeah. if you, if you sign up, you get this, okay. um, you get this bonus. Yeah. So. Awesome. So if a person doesn't end up signing up, yeah. Um, like that's all, probably your, one of your first goals is to get them to, mm -hmm. to sign up for the subscription box. Is there something else they could buy before that? Like, is there another way they can enter and f try your vegetables out? So because we have the spring market box going, I've found that people that are finding out about me right now, and I've been trying to market my summer box too, they're like, eh, I'm just going to try it out and buy the spring box. So, <laughs> so <Nice>. that's working. <laughs> it's almost like a trial membership. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because it's a short term. It's also a shorter term, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And they get to get familiar with the tools in their account and how it works and what it would be like in the summer. So I think that I, that's a great, cause now I can roll those people say, Hey, have you been enjoying the spring market box? Summer's even better. So awesome. So that can almost become what maybe one of the goals of your funnel is just to get them in there yeah. Yeah. as the yeah. trial sort of thing. And then yeah. the next step in the funnel is like, now I want to upsell them into the yeah. next season membership. Yeah, that works in this season right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Fair so, enough. Yeah. yeah. 
So, but um, the goal, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if the goal isn't just buy my CSA or my, yeah. sorry, my market box for this season, but like you ultimately want to keep, you want to turn them to a customer that just rolls over. Just, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So after they get that, if they drop off and they don't, um, if they don't buy my subscription to during that email sequence, they, um, they just become a subscriber and they start getting my Friday farm news emails, which I consider my nurturing campaign because, um, because I'm actually doing a pretty good job. <laughs> I bet. You guys, um, on her on her website, she has a section that says, uh, oh, I just love how you worded it. it the best basically... farm stories in the valley. Yes. And then you're like, don't believe me? Try a sample. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read one? I didn't open it, no. But I was like, that's so clever. I love it. Um, you know, I do, I mean, one of my goals is to create a nurture sequence um, because I've realized that I do have some key content that I've created over the years that I'd love to just evergreen recycle and and train my members, my new members, especially on how to think and how to, how to get the best experience out of their market box. Um, so that's definitely a goal. But I've re- also realized that I don't have to do that because I am nur- like, yes. I'm not feeling guilty about not having yes. a nurture sequence um, in the past because my Friday farm newsletters are interesting. And you asked me, um, you know, what's the biggest surprise in marketing or, um, or what you do really well. And I would say my Friday farm newsletter, my news emails um, and my YouTube videos. Um, are the biggest surprise. And, you know, when you started talking about copywriting and how to change how, uh, just write a like a letter to your best customer. Um, I started doing that and it really simplified things and it really made farm stories come alive. And, um, and now when I meet members, you know, a lot of our members are um, home delivery and they don't come, uh, don't ever come to the farm. But when I get emails from them, or when they come to the farm for something after years of being members, they say, I love your emails. I love your videos. <laughs> you know? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, people don't believe me when I say that. I'm like, no, oh, it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and when I review story brand framework and I, when I'm um, doing my, my newsletter, my email on Friday. And then I'd step back and say, okay, am I, am I hitting the points at the beginning in order to get people into this story? Um, when I do that, they're even better you now. So, mm, so good. So you have a weekly email discipline yeah. that is continuing to cultivate the relationship, not only yeah. for the people that have bought and are like in the club, yeah. but also those who have fallen, have fallen, you know, I don't want to say into the black hole because you're, you're keeping them from falling into the email black hole, but you're, right. you're trying to get them to come back and right. give, give yeah. your product a try. So to give context to that, mm-hmm. I have 2,500 members, subscribers on my email list mm-hmm. and um, I'm getting close to a 40% open rate for that. Um, so, and I've seen it climb in the last year. So I'm mm-hmm. pretty excited about that. That's great. <laughs> That's great. So awesome. Okay. So do you also have a, do you have any other products that you can upsell them into? So I know you've got all kinds of things they could just put into their market box, but do you try to push anything else throughout the year or do they have a chance to add more things to their box every week? If they go over their limit, right. They could just say, throw in another $30 worth of stuff. Is that, does that happen? Yeah. Yeah, so definitely we're going to continue to add exciting products. So this year we um, we had a connection with uh, a fancy mushroom grower. She reached out to us and we said, and so now we can offer not just the plain old organic mushrooms that we've had for a couple of years, but now we can do um, oyster mushrooms and lion's means and, and those things. So we're we're scaling, um, our, we're cultivating our mushroom lovers. Um, 
grasp and they don't have to commit to a mushroom share because they can just get it in their box when they see it, when they, you know, and when they want it. Um, so we're going to continue to do things like that, make connections with local producers um, and, and explain to people and why they should be interested in these products and why they should try them. And so we're always going to, so I realized, you know, what's the next step for a $35 mini market box? It's to get them excited about enough products that they're willing to go to the $65 box or to go to every week instead of every other week. Um, but you also asked about other events or things that we have on the farm. And I think that's part of our customer's journey, um, just getting more connected to us. We're not doing pizza nights as much for the revenue. We definitely want to get enough revenue out of it in order to make it worth it. But um, we, so we say we do pizza nights because our kids love our pizza. <laughs> And we want to eat it too. <laughs> um, and we know it's the best pizza in, in the Valley because it's organic sourdough brick oven pizza crust with fresh vegetables and cheese that we've made on the farm and sometimes meat that's come, you know, from us or from another producer. So where can you get that? You can't. And our customers who come to pizza nights, they know that and they, and they love doing it. So we've, Last year, I was able to get um, pizza nights on the schedule every month, and I was also able to get um, farm tours on the schedule every month. Now, we don't have a huge crowd of people coming to farm tours, but I want it on the calendar so that when the people become a member, they can say, oh, cool, I could do this if I wanted to. I could bring my kids, yeah. you know, and we had a couple of people each time. And it's a great chance for them to talk to us and see see what's going on here. Um, it doesn't take a lot out of us, but just to have that on the calendar as a farm experience for people to look forward to or say, I could take part of in yeah. is great. Well, and those are moments where something <clears throat> special happens with the customer and the brand. Yeah. And it only needs to happen once or twice. Yeah. And then they're even more loyal and bought in. So I think that's actually really smart to try and build build in an experience like that so that it becomes the goal, whether it's spoken out loud or not, it becomes the goal for every customer to make sure that I go to a pizza night at some point or I go and tour the farm at some point in my relationship with this yeah. farmer. It's almost like you create, I'm doing a, a podcast episode that's releasing this next week um, on this concept of having a punch list for mm. your, your customers, things yeah. that they should try to achieve, right? Give mm, them a pathway mm -hmm. to follow, try to do these things while you're with us. And when you, when you have things for people to consume, um, they'll, they'll consume it, they'll do it. And that's, that's a great, great example idea. of life. Yeah, and that's a great idea. What if, we, what if we created a little punch list graphic and we sent mm -hmm. it to them with their membership and said, okay, yeah. have you done this? Have you yeah. done this? <laughs> have you yeah. done this? Do you want to hear about our best farm experience? Yeah, <laughs> Besides sure. tonight. Yes. Um, foster a check. Um, before the week before Easter, we get because we've raised hens on our farm for a long time. We've always gotten um, chicks in the spring, and actually we started doing this because CSA members about ten years ago asked us. They said, "Have you ever thought about letting people take chicks home and take care of them for a little while?" And we said, "That wouldn't be a problem. Why not?" <laughs> So now it's actually a, it's actually a thing that takes me a whole month to run. Um, and people are asking me in February and sending me emails and saying, when is foster chick? When is foster chick? When I, can I, when can I reserve my chicks? And we added ducklings because um, those are even cuter. Um, and so I have a sales sequence for, um, for, chick rent foster chick um i have them re reserve their chicks then they this year they're gonna get invited to a telegram community where they can um post pictures and ask questions and things like that and they get to come to the farm take a pair of chicks home in a box they get all the instructions uh, there's another drip email sequence for them that tells them, okay, these are what the things that you're going to need before you come. These are the things you're going to need to do after you come. And then, um, and then they bring them back like 
two weeks later or two months later or whatever they get. Oh, they do. They so do. you get them back. <laughs> we get them back um, because they don't want, they can't keep them. You know, they just want the experience. They just want to have a little pet for a short time for their two-year-old or their three-year-old or grandparents want it for Easter weekend when their, grand, when their kids come and visit, their grandkids come and visit. And they just want that experience and that connection to farm life or to taking mm. care of something that needs them. And so it fills so many of those philosophical and interior needs that people have. Um, and it, they love it. They get, and, and we have our kids run the program. Um, I do all the email and the kind of the back stuff, back end stuff. But when people come to the farm, we tell them our kids are going to greet you and they're going to help you. And if you have a, you know, if there's a problem or a question, ask to talk to a parent, but these are your guides <laughs> as our kids, because they know everything and they've been taking care of the care of the animals. Oh, that's so neat. And now do all of the chicks make it? I mean, or do you usually lose a few? We usually use a, lose a few and, you know, and I tell them, you know, sometimes farm animals die and it's not your fault, yeah. you know, yeah. and we don't charge you for the, for, for the chick the that investment. doesn't make it. And in fact, right. we usually can replace it yeah. for someone. So. Now, are they paying you to <clears throat> rent this chick? Yeah. This chick? Okay, yeah. So, so you're... they're, um, this year it's $25 for a pair and they get a box and they get a bag of feed because we want them to be eating the organic feed that they're going to eat when they come back. So mm -hmm. um, we try to be strict with that and say, these are going to grow up to be organic chickens. So yeah. please feed yeah. them what we give you yeah. and you can come back and get more feed because we know that we're going to get the chicks back. So yeah. Oh, I love that. Everyone is going to call you now and be like, hey, <laughs> email me that sequence. I want yeah. that drip sequence. <laughs> That's awesome. I've, yeah, I've thought about, you know, creating a little package um, that could, you know, could be um, could be sold for a small fee yeah. or something. Um, yeah. So that's do kind it. of on my list of to do, do it. My, my list of things to do. Love it. <laughs> Today's podcast is sponsored by my digital ebook called The Tips and Tricks for CSA Success. This is my customizable beginner's guide to CSA that you can give to your CSA members to help them learn the ropes for CSA faster. So if you are a CSA farmer that constantly worries about whether or not your members are experiencing failure with the box, maybe you sense that they're wasting a lot of their food and you're not sure what you need to teach them in order to be successful with the CSA way, I have created this digital template, an ebook, to help them learn what they need to know. It's basically my beginner's guide for CSA members. The guide covers the storage tips, the veggie exit strategies they need to learn, preservation techniques, and just general CSA best practices. All of those secrets of the CSA masters in one short, easy to read guide. When you get this product, you'll receive the complete 24 page finished PDF file template. So you could just print it out as a PDF, but you also get the customizable file on canva.com. So you, I give you the link to the original on Canva. You can go make a copy and then fit it to your farm's style and look. So for example, in my version, I added my farm's logo to the cover page. I changed a few of the images out. And then I added a whole extra page all about my Facebook group and unboxing video because that's a key feature in my CSA. It is a beautiful piece of branding that is really going to wow your members and make them feel like you spent hours of time making this guide for them. It's going to be a huge impression. Tessa talked about it briefly today in our podcast episode where she shared that she gave this away to people in her sales email sequence about the market box subscription. It's her bonus if they decide to sign up. I think it's a really helpful tool that's going to move the needle forward for your CSA members and help more of them experience success faster. If you want to see a sample, you can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash CSA success to learn more. And now back to the show. Okay, I want to make sure I ask you about your website because sure. your website is gorgeous. Not Thank only is you. it gorgeous, but it it's so well messaged. And I want everyone listening, especially <laughs> if you're trying to update your website messaging, 
I think that your website is a really good example to look at as a template. Thank you. Um, and is it willowhavenfarmpa.com? Yeah, it okay. is. Um, so you can go, just go look at that and you will see immediately what I mean. There's just a, a really great flow in terms of what information is presented and in what order, the sequence. But there also is just a lot of clarity and simplicity in the messaging. The, the headings that you choose to put above each block of text, they're clear, but they're also witty. And so they show, they show some personality. So can you just talk to me about the evolution of your, of your website messaging and how did it come to be? Yeah, well, I've been thinking and thinking and thinking about our message for, for years, ever since you started talking about story brand marketing. And I bought the book and um, have did, listened to some of your um, book study last winter. And um, just I just keep revisiting it and keep thinking about it, especially since our farm keeps changing, right? Um, and so, so this year we knew we knew that we needed to simplify the message and update the website. And because we have um, some budget, we did enlist some people to help us. So I do have a marketing person who's um, listened to me and is familiar with StoryBrand and has, you know, has been working with me. And so she's been developing a little bit of the messaging with me. And we're, we've been doing it together as a team and doing it as a team really, 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 really helps um, because I get stuck, you know, and when you get stuck, you don't make progress and you can't, you can't update things. And um, so, so I've, I've been wanting to update the website and make it better for at least two winters um, and having someone working with me and pushing me um, has made it happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what headings do you like, Corinna? Oh, gosh, <laughs> I know. I want to like, go look at it. I have, did I have it open? I still have it open. Um, well, so you have your homepage, but then you have an RCSA tab as well. Yeah. So, and that's going to change. It needs to change and not say RCSA. Probably, um, but, but you, so you, you have a, how it works tab where you've got step one, step two, step three, and it's mm -hmm. very clear, like subscribe, customize, enjoy. Um, you have, will you, will you love a market box subscription? And that's the heading that you choose for the testimonial section, which mm -hmm. is, I love. Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're talking right to the person. You'll never miss the farmer's market again. That's your heading. Look what you can get in a market box subscription. And then you've got all those icons for the different products that you could throw in. And when just, I, when I came up with that line, I it just popped out of my head and I was because part of it is you know the the it takes commitment it takes planning and it to go to the farmer's market right and it's only one window a week and if you miss it you miss it on like three different levels you missed it because of the time you missed it because you didn't get the food um and so I realized when it came out of my mouth and I said, you'll never miss the farmer's market again, it means the box is coming to you. So you don't have to worry about what time the farmer's market is. And once you start getting our boxes of food, you won't miss going mm -hmm. <laughs> because that need is taken care of. Yeah, yeah. it's it's so good because it kind of positions you as the mm -hmm. online farmer's market vendor too, just sure. the language. Um, and then you have, I also liked how you chose to talk about the membership uh, features. You call them membership perks. So you have okay. a heading that says, enjoy membership perks. And then you just have a widget or a stack um, for each item that you want to talk about, as opposed to making this bullet point list of here's what comes with the membership. You know, you're choosing to break it apart into little sound bites that are much more easily digestible when you're scrolling through. So okay. going away, we offer flexible vacation scheduling. Variety of choices is the second one, right? So it's just so good and you hardly have any words. There's so much white space. <laughs> okay, good. All, you're, you're doing all the right thing. Um, and then your tagline, local farm food that fits your life. And you have this beautiful picture of a girl opening a bag of greens. Is that your daughter or one of your customers? No, we had a photo photographer, yeah. that's her daughter. It is such a good picture. Um, it's just like, if I were a mom with kids, I'd be like, 
oh my gosh, they understand me. I want to do this. So, I want my kids to unpack my box and see what's there. Yeah. Well, cause it shows the picture of the box. So you yeah. can see what the product is, but more importantly, you see the life transformation yeah. in the actual customer itself. And you imagine that could be me, right? You're yeah. already like mirroring yourself in that picture. So many, so many good things. You have the problem section. You have a picture of the farm, a gorgeous picture of the farm in your family. Um, cause people want to know who the farmer is. That's right up near the top. You guys, seriously, just go look at her website. It's so well done. And what I think we're all going to do is just use yours as a template and we're all going to read it. That's fine. Website, I've been copying so. yours for years. So <laughs> I still feel like mine has too many words on it. So uh, we're just going to keep looking at each other's. How's that? Until all right, we, that sounds good. we all look so similar to each other by the end. But, um, well, so, so talk to me about, I, we have to kind of wrap up here, but I sure. want you to kind of, I know you've been following um, my work for the last two years. We've met up at a conference and, you know, hung out for most of the day together. That was uh, fun. So, so fun. that was fun. And I know that um, you have learned a lot and tried out a lot of things that I've been teaching over the years. Yeah. You've certainly taught me some things. What have been the, the big aha moments? Because one of the things that farmers often ask me is like, look, there's so much stuff you teach me. Yeah. Uh, there's so much stuff you could do in marketing. How much do I really need to do? And like, what's the stuff that really moves the needle that I should start here? And what yeah. stuff is really, eh, you know, it's nice if you can get to it, but not so nice. I'm kind of curious how you would answer that question as you've journeyed through this. You really have developed as a marketer over time at Big Time. Yeah, I think. And so what, what, what's worked? What hasn't worked? What have you learned along the way that matters? Um. We mentioned it before, but the Friday Farm News newsletter, I think, is the most important piece of, of my marketing retail. So I kind of block off all of Friday afternoons to make sure that I have time to write a compelling story. And during the week, I'm always thinking about what's the story for the week and what is my subject line going to be, you know? And so I'm constantly listening to my kids for um, for funny things that they say around the farm. Um, another thing that I was surprised about was just getting out in the field and doing a three to five minute YouTube video, just finding somewhere on the farm where I could explain something that was seasonal or that was interesting. Um, and it, my kids tag along and sometimes they pop into the video and it just all gives this really this raw, real family life, nitty gritty farm feel to it. Um, people that sometimes I think they pop on the newsletter to watch the video and not and read the newsletter, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it, and I felt that it's really, really important to connect in both of these ways, the email and the, and the video because we're doing home delivery and because that, I've been trying to cultivate a relationship with us as the farmers um, over social media, you know, over bridging that gap because we're not requiring them to take time out of their lives to come to the farm every week. Um, and we're also not like you guys, you know, you're the faces at the, at the farm market, at the pickup, you know, we're not, we're not there like that. And so they, in order to see our faces, I have to make a video and I have to show them the farm and I don't do it every week um, during the summer more often it's every week I give myself a little bit of a break in the winter <laughs> so that I'm not having to produce the content but it, try to make it at least every other week because um, we're still doing deliveries those I think that um, is the biggest piece of what I do that helps um, build our brand and build um, and to nurture people because there are people that will sit on that email list for years and then finally they're at a place in their life where they can I can subscribe I can yeah. become a member so when you say you do YouTube videos are these highly produced or is it like you're getting your phone out and you're just doing a quick explanation and then uploading it to YouTube it's That's yep, what it's we a one-shot video three yeah. to five minutes try to you know have say something interesting at the beginning to to get people interested and try to make a reference to some call to action or at least say my website at the end yeah. um 
And, you know, sometimes I miss those things, but it's not worth my time to make it perfect. You know, if I totally blunder, of course I'll do it again, you know, and then it's just, then it's just up. Then I just Mm -hmm. upload it to, to YouTube YouTube. so I can have a link to share. Yeah. And it's great because it does good things for your SEO while you're at it. You know, if you've got regular content, plus it becomes the kernel of content. It's like, this is the thing that I can talk about in the email, right? It, it, yeah. It's almost like it, it's the starting point Yeah. for so I, whatever you Sometimes I'll about. build the story around it. Sometimes that's the story. Sometimes mm-hmm. a story will lead to that, you know? And so, but yeah. Is there a reason you don't do that on Facebook Live or are you doing Facebook Lives too? I'm not doing Facebook Lives. Um, I think the reason why I'm not doing it like that is because you can't do it both at the same time, or at least I haven't mm-hmm. figured out, like yeah. you can do a Facebook live video and then you have to take the same video and sit yeah. Yeah. and then upload it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that could be something I do this year. I don't yeah. know. You actually can. So you can do you it can. on Facebook live and okay. then you can download it from <clears throat> Facebook as an MP4 file. Okay. And then uh, that's how I used to do it. So I'd make the original content on Facebook, download it, and then stick it on YouTube. Awesome. Is there anything else that jumps to mind as far as like what you've learned along the way? I know you wanted to talk about something um, about how this is a a process. Learning marketing is a process and you don't just throw it all into the hopper your first year. Yeah. I mean, listening to your podcasts and and your trainings over the years has, you know, given me goals to achieve. Like, yeah, someday I'm going to do that. Someday I'm going to get, get that, put that piece in place. Um, and I just kind of let it naturally happen throughout the course of each season and, or each winter. What is it that I can tackle, you know? So it took me years to do a sales launch in March. And now I did it once and I created these PDFs and I did some Facebook live videos. I've only done it once, but now I know I can do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I've got some, some content to, to do again, um, maybe this March or April. Um, And so these pieces, you just keep building and building and building, and then you've got content, you've got things to rely on, and it makes it so much easier to do CSA week every week when you've got five or six emails that you can just recycle again. It's not such a huge burden. And the one thing you were asking was, um, what isn't worth my time? And one of my big questions is posting on social media. For me, it's super time consuming. Um, I have a lot of content. It could go there. But I find that when I sit down to do it, um, it takes me an hour to do a post because I want it to be a certain way and I want it to have these tags and, um, you know, and, and with that in just, and I don't think I have the following um, that makes it worth it. So I'm not exact, I, I think there's still a piece of how do we get more people to our newsletter, you know? Um, and we haven't, we've, tr- we've done some expensive Facebook ad experiences that have been good. Um, and the guilt comes in with social media, like, okay, if I was posting every week or every other week, would I be cultivating more people? I mean, multiple times a week, would I be pulling more people into my funnel or not? You know, mm-hmm. cause where, where are those people? I need to reach those people and how do I get them? to subscribe so and is it worth the time that I'm putting into it yeah you know is that is that really an ROI yeah um yeah I mean that's a if you're asking me for my advice right now (laughs) I I think that um you know is it Facebook is it Instagram do we have to be on both how many times do I have to post what like it's a whole nother thing that you have to think about and I do think that social media can be a huge time suck I think it actually probably is for many of us um the goal of social media for me is to get people on my email list. Yeah. Yeah. And so any social media strategy is really for me is top of funnel stuff. It's creating content that's attracting my ideal customer into my ecosystem in the first place. And then making sure I have a regular rhythm of like, here's the lead magnet. Here's the lead magnet. Here's the lead magnet. Right. Um, 
do people actually buy from posts that I put on social media? No, not really. Yeah. Um, but I do think there are some farmers who have figured that sure. out on sure. Instagram yeah. who are crushing it. But for me, the purchases aren't, the conversions aren't happening through social media. It's the, it's the attracting the right person mm -hmm. and introducing them to my products, introducing them to the farmer and the story. So when you say, here's my lead magnet over and over again, are you doing a post then saying, if you want to know more, download this? Or are you um, just putting a picture of the lead magnet out there and say- I'll do both. So there's like okay. an indirect, there, it's called indirect posting and direct posting. So the okay. direct posting is like, here's the image of the lead magnet. Like it's flat out, like grab the guide. It's very overt. Yeah. And the indirect is more where you might have a story that you're telling and then it shows up or you're talking about anything else. Yeah. And then it shows up yeah. kind of later on in the post as like, hey, I have a guide, you can grab it here. Yeah. Um, or in a video. So a lot of times I'll do it in videos if I'm out doing a Facebook Live and I'm narrating something behind me, it'll be my call to action. Hey, if you mm -hmm. wanna learn more about our CSA, grab our guide, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then it goes into, I go and edit the post later and add that in. Well, so, it's been exciting to watch your, your business grow and develop over time and that's a discussion for another day, but I, sure. I think that's normal for every farm business to start out with, you know, this is what I think we're doing. And then you get more and more clear over time mm -hmm. where you're actually taking people or what kind of customer you're attracting. Yeah. And the simpler you can get about what your messaging is, what your product is, what your funnel is. I think the easier it is to run your business. It sounds like you've gotten that and it's I, really, exciting. yeah, I think I feel good about that. Yeah. 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 And the one thing I, I didn't get to say about it, um, is that we're, there's a lot of companies that are trying to be these farmers market, these online farmers market, there's hubs, there's misfit markets, there's all different configurations of, we can connect you to local food. And um, I did a Facebook live video about this in 2020 and said, look, if you look at these, they're not really, you know, they're not small farms and they're not local to you. And so, um, and so we want to be a farm that yes, is curating from other farmers, but we're still in the farming game. We're still growing food for you and we're, and we're real farmers. And this is how we are. Um, this is our livelihood. This is how we're raising our family. This is how we're eating. So we're invested in it the same as you are, um, we're not just a venture capital company that's that that has tons of marketing dollars and <laughs> and, and saying all the right things and saying so, all the right things yeah. yeah yeah so we 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 want to take the hassle out we want to connect people to to lo good really good local food but we want to still be their farmers this has been so fun. I wish I could keep talking. Um, <laughs> let's connect again just to hang out over Zoom. Sure. I, I feel like every time I talk to you, I get better at my own cool. craft. Um, how can people learn more about you if they want to check out what you're doing with your awesome messaging? Yeah, well, just go to my website, willowhavenfarmpa.com and then subscribe, try to start getting the best farm stories in the Valley and, um, and you'll get to see how I create stories, how I do videos in the field and um, how I sell my products, so. What's the name of your YouTube channel too? Cause I'll link that up in the show notes. It's Willow Haven Farm, I think. It? Okay, yeah. I'll do a search for that. You can find it that way, yep. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. It's You're so welcome. Great. Yeah, um, I love it. It's awesome. Wasn't that great? Tessa is such a good marketer. And I hope you get a chance to go check out her website because it, it is really a great template to start with if you're trying to figure out how to message your CSA. So glad she came on the show. You know, I've had this secret dream to create a small group mastermind of female farmers to hang out with every six weeks or so during the year just to kind of sharpen our marketing acts. And if I ever do something like that, I am going to be asking Tessa to be in that group because she is just so good and I really value her friendship. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. You can grab the show notes at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 152. If you haven't subscribed yet to the show, please do so. And don't forget, I'm now on Instagram. I would love it if you would subscribe. I'm at mydigitalfarmer. I show up there almost every day with a marketing tip to help coach you along in your journey. 
Thanks so much for being here today, guys. Have a wonderful week and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.